He was in a party and he felt a presence overtake him and say some words like Nijananda Rupam, uh, uh, you know, Shivo Hum, Shivo Hum. He, he, it wasn't him, it was just he could feel a presence come into him and say those words. So much love to you and welcome to a Spiritual Sense podcast. What does it actually take to become enlightened? What does that really even mean? If we want to become enlightened or experience higher states of consciousness, we need to learn from enlightened beings, people who actually are enlightened, who have gone through the challenges, who have gone through the steps, who have actually done the work and are able to share with us what they did and how we can do that too. So today we are experiencing something very magical. We're going to give you an opportunity to learn from an enlightened being who you probably This is a fascinating episode. Make sure you get a pen and paper ready because we're going to be sharing some very profound insights and stories that can change your life. Welcome, Shireen. How are you doing? Good. Nice to be here with you, Michael. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. So what a happy you... day. Yes, it's a very happy day. We are very blessed and I'd love to hear your story, your experience of how you discovered this enlightened person, this enlightened soul. So about three decades ago, I walked into a Brahma Kumari's meditation center and I didn't know, right? I grew up in India and um, even though there were many centers, I didn't hear about the Brahma Kumaris, maybe because at that time they weren't that well known. And I didn't know there was one very close to my house, but I didn't know who they were, what they were, nothing. I just found something. Uh, I found a brochure and I really liked it. And I liked something they said in the brochure. And so I went to the center. And as soon as I walked in, I wasn't sure I was in the right place for various reasons, which I'll share the story some other time. Hmm. But on the <laughs> side, right, on the side was... Uh, Brahma Baba's photo. So the sister who was teaching the meditation course, um, I wasn't sure I connected with her. I wasn't sure, she, you know, what was going on. But when she started speaking and when I did the meditation, I had such profound experiences that that day I went back understanding and knowing that in some way my life has changed. But because of the meditation experience I had, right? She didn't mention Brahma Baba. She didn't do anything. It was just, there was a, a picture on the side, but there was nothing else. And so um, what happened was the next day I came back, again, profound experiences with the knowledge that was shared and the experiences that I had with meditation. I, it would, I really connected with all of it. And so what happened was... Um, I walked out of the meditation center after two days of taking the foundation course, what we call the foundation course. And um, the sister said, oh, I'll see you later. And I thought, I doubt it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not coming back, <laughs> right? I, I just felt whatever I needed, I got it in the experience. I don't need to go to a center, all of those things. <laughs> so that's what I thought, oh, I doubt it. But the next day I'm at work and right where my desk is on the right, I feel a presence. It's a very subtle presence. And I feel a presence. I'm working and I feel a presence. And I realize somehow in that moment, I realized that that presence was Brahma Baba. It's that feeling, you know, even though I just saw a photo, there was a feeling about him that I didn't realize I got, that there was a feeling about him that I got that later I saw mm -hmm. here, right? But I knew instantly that this presence I'm feeling is Brahma Baba. And, and it was a very beautiful feeling, right? It was just a very gentle, loving, benef benefic presence. And then I thought, whoa, it's that, that same 
person I saw in the photo mm -hmm. briefly, right? I didn't even realize this, all of this registered when I was in the center, but when I feel was feeling the presence, I realized, oh, all of this registered. And then um, the next day uh, I was so enamored by what was shared, right? I took a few of my friends from work to uh, lunch and I told them everything right mm -hmm. from top to bottom everything or one lunch and then I was I was seeing Brahma Baba again lunchtime right standing there and just being there and and then um, the next day I was sleeping and in the middle of the night I woke up because I felt a presence and then again I felt that presence Brahma Baba's presence right and after two or three days I'm like what do you want <laughs> And uh, this is my question. I'm like, why am I feeling your presence and what do you want? And um, anyway, a few days later, I went to the center again uh, because I really felt Brahma Baba was invoking me to go to the center, even though I didn't realize at that, at that time, I think the presence was just, you know, uh, urging me, like, you know, it's like... Mm -hmm moving me in that direction so i went back to the center a few days later and then and then i had a good look i'm like so you're following me and so who are you right and so this happened for a few weeks till i started going to the center regularly a few weeks for a few weeks i felt brahma baba's presence every day whether i was sleeping whether i was eating whether i was at work everywhere this very subtle presence and then once I started going to the center regularly every day I started going to the center every day then I stopped feeling his presence and then I was mm -hmm. like I started missing it I'm like what happened <laughs> should I stop yeah. coming so I can feel your presence again <laughs> and so and then after I started going to the center I realized that he was my guardian angel that the presence I was feeling was the presence of a guardian angel. And then over the years, I've noticed that Brahma Baba is everyone's guardian angel. And he is so benefic, so beautiful, so all-encompassing, so generous that he doesn't see these distinctions that we see. It doesn't matter whether people accept him or not, right? He's still this angelic guardian angel presence in everyone's life and some of us are aware of it and some of us are not that's an amazing story what a wonder what a wonder now you run the center right <laughs> right the fact that i'm sitting here i really feel is because of his guidance because of his angelic guiding presence in my life so initially it was very strong and very powerful the presence but now I feel it's not that it's not there, but I can access it whenever I need. So can you share a little bit more about Brahma Baba? Because some people probably don't know who he is. And who, what is his story? So Brahma Baba in, uh, so let's uh, go back to 1930s. So in the 1930s in India, Brahma Baba was a very wealthy jeweler. And he had business, uh, he had a jewelry business. And at that time, it was the British rule. So India and Pakistan were uh, the same country, or it was under the British. It was not exactly a country, it was under the British. And so he had a uh, jewelry business in Hyderabad, Sindh, which is now in Pakistan, and in Calcutta, Kolkata, or however you say it, which is in um, India. And so what happened was um, he used to go back and forth. So around 1936, what happened was he was around close to 60 in 1936. He was close to 60 and he was feeling um, that something was pulling him, right? And he didn't know what it was, that something was changing in him. He was, you know, he had many gurus before. He's, he had 11 gurus before. And he was a very devout um, Hindu. He, he used to read the Gita very regularly. And so he was very, very much um, a devoted person. And so what happened was in 
1936, he started having visions. It was a very unusual vision in that he had a vision. This was before the atomic bomb. He had a vision of a mushroom cloud. When this mushroom cloud came on, the whole world went into darkness. And then he saw this world of beautiful light, beautiful people, and all of these souls were coming down as points of light and taking on bodies and inhabiting a very, very beautiful, beautiful earth. And so he wasn't understanding what was happening. What was this mushroom cloud? Because remember, it was before the atomic bomb. What was this mushroom cloud? He wasn't understanding what was going on with um, uh, the beautiful earth, all of those things. So he went into seclusion in Benares, Kashi. Uh, from, so he was going back and forth between Hyderabad and Kolkata, Hyderabad, Pakistan and Kolkata. And he went into seclusion in uh, Benares. And so when he was there, he had some profound realizations of the nature of time and all of these things. And so what happened was when he went back, Oh, one of the things you have to understand is there was this one time he was in a party. This was in 1936. What started, what started this reflection? What started what was happening with him? He was in a party and he felt a presence overtake him and say some words like Nijananda Rupams or, uh, you know, Shivoham, Shivoham. He, it wasn't him. It was just he could feel a presence come into him and say those words. Um, and so that is what started it actually. And so he would, and many people were witness to the, that uh, incident that happened where he just felt this presence and, you know, this presence was saying these words. And so when he went back to Hyderabad from Benares, he realized that he started something called O Mandali. And in Om Mandali, what happened was he um, he invited everyone to come and chant Om. And also he was sharing some of his realizations that he had when he was in Benares. And also this presence kept coming back and sharing few things with Brahma Baba. A few hundred people were also having visions, similar visions to what Brahma Baba had. And so, um, so they all started coming to him and he started advocating very revolutionary things like women leaders, women spiritual leaders and all of these things. And so his, he was very respected member of his society, very respected. He was very wealthy, very respected. He had a lot of honor in society and people started really getting upset with him because he was saying women should be leaders, women can be leaders and, you know, all of these things. Um, they should be following certain disciplines and the, everyone were happy. The women were happy, but the men weren't happy because of the, upsetting the status quo. So they, a few hundred of them, because a few hundred of them started coming to uh, Om Mandali. And so a few hundred of them and Brahma Baba, because of all of the upheaval that was going on in uh, Hyderabad at that time, moved from Hyderabad Sin to Karachi. And so in Karachi, they went into really seclusion and for uh, 14 years. From 1936, they were really in seclusion. 1936 to 1950, they, all they did was meditate. They had intense meditation, the, what we call tapasya, right? That's all they did. 14 years. And in that 14 years, a lot of these concepts that we share in the Brahma Kumaris became more clear because Brahma Baba knew who was talking, what was happening, that there was a supreme soul and he was just being a mouthpiece for what was happening in time, what was the nature of what was happening. And the most important thing about Brahma Baba, actually several things which are very important about Brahma Baba, but one of the most important things is he was very wealthy uh, businessman. He was a jeweler and he gave all his wealth in trust to eight young women and made them trustees. And the eight young women actually 
administered the trust, administered all of the 350 people who went into seclusion with him. So that's how it got started for 14, 14 years. That was the seed money that got started the whole organization, mm -hmm. right? His money, seed money got started. And then um, after, in 1947, India and Pakistan split. Then they moved to India and uh, they moved to Mount Abu where our headquarters is. And then they started doing service outside of India. And then they started doing service in on countries outside of India. <laughs> in, in First in India, they started doing service in India, then countries outside of in India. And now we here we are. Oh, mm -hmm. and January 18th, 1969. So Brahma Baba made intense spiritual effort intense 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 he was such a good example for us because he made such intense spiritual effort for 33 years from 1936 to 1969 and he became abhyakt abhyakt means an uh, uh, unmanifest you know vyakt means physical abhyakt means beyond the physical. So he became an angel. He became a guardian angel on January 18th, 1969. Do you want to add anything, Michael, to that story? It's a remarkable story. And I think you did a great job of summing that up. So he, he did intense effort for 33 years. And we have a lot to learn from him. So he's changed the lives of millions of people. And was a real example. You know, a lot of people, they talk about things and they don't practice it. But he really practiced everything. I know, right? He really walked the talk. Absolutely walked the talk. So simple, so amazing. So many miraculous stories and miracles and bizarre, wondrous things. Like people trying to assassinate him and, and just dropping the weapons and just feeling the light. And just this amount of stories that I've heard. So, so, so this is someone that we need to pay very close attention to as very powerful teachings that we can use in our lives. And we're just going to share seven things, and we could easily have 108 things, uh, but that would then take about 25 hours. So we're going to keep to the <laughs> essence here. Um, yeah, so. yeah. I was thinking and some thought just came to me. Why is it that we need to listen to his story? Why is it that we need to follow what he did? We all want to be angels, right? Angels are so popular in the world. And he was one soul that did something and became an angel. And we can follow that example and really become angels. If one human being can do it, other people can do it. That's right, because we are spiritual beings after all. So we are angelic spiritual beings in a body. So he just allowed himself to transcend the limitations of the physical body. So let's go into these seven things that he embodied. And there's much more than seven, but we're just keeping it to the essence. What is the first thing that we can learn from him? <laughs> Um, the first thing I think is, remember I said he felt a presence. Mm -hmm. When he was in Calcutta, he was actually, you know, when he was in Calcutta, all of the Maharajas at that time, all the kings at that time were his customers. And so he was in a party with very, uh, you know, esteemed people, renowned people. And he, in the middle of the party, he felt this presence, right, saying, and then he went to or side room he went to his room and he and then a few people followed him thinking what happened to baba they heard this that nijananda rupam shivoham shivoham prakasham rupam shivoham shivoham means this i am this uh, this nijananda means um this ever blissful form i am shiva i am shiva and so then he realized in that 14 years of tapasya that they had that that it was not him speaking, but that there was supreme soul was coming and engaging his body to give knowledge to the world. And so when he heard this knowledge, right, whatever instructions he got, 
from this presence, from the Supreme Soul. Whatever instructions he got, the first instruction he got was to give up all his wealth and give it to these eight women and make them trustees. And he put those instructions into practice. And so it didn't matter what the instruction was. He immediately, th that was the first instruction, but all his 33 years, right? He got several instructions about so many things and he changed everything. He changed his whole mind. He changed his whole heart. He changed everything and put every instruction into practice. And I feel it's not just about putting instructions into practice, right? I feel if you want enlightenment, that you have to pick one path and you have to really go into that path deeply. Because nowadays people have a spiritual buffet, right? I take this from here, this from here, this from here. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can get enlightenment like that, right? You pick one path and you go deep, deeply into that path. And so Brahma Baba really demonstrated that. He followed instructions. He went deeply into this path and he, he demonstrated to us that this is possible because of that. What do you think? Yeah. Well, by the way, we're not asking anyone to give up all their wealth and give it to a bunch of young women, just to be clear. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's, that's not the lesson. But the lesson yeah, maybe is Maybe, Michael, bring out your checkbook. Let's see. Getting out your checkbook, <laughs> just hand it over to the sisters. But the, we'll, the first, is, we'll first ask Michael to do it. How about that, Michael? That's right. We'll start with Brother Michael. <laughs> so start In, with Brother Michael. That's right. I have to honestly tell you this. In my almost 30 years of spiritual practice with the Brahma Kumaris, people say so many things about it, but not one person ever asked me for money. That's very interesting. It's something that a lot of people don't know is that the Brahma Kumaris is donation-based. And I've never been asked for money either. I've been involved in this meditation practice for 25, six, six years. And never been asked for any money. And it's remarkable. There's so many centers and so many retreat centers and like big, big buildings and all this stuff. And it's just funded by people who want to give without being asked. And nonprofits and these companies think, how on earth is this actually possible? Because I don't know any other, um, anything else that does this. Because a lot of people do some sort of uh, nonprofits, but they're always asking for money and always fundraising constantly. But this is totally different. Somehow it happens. You know, another misconception yeah. people have is people feel that we are funded from our headquarters in India, our spiritual headquarters in India, which is in Mount Abu, or that Brahma Baba left behind this big trust and that's what we are funded. The money that Brahma Baba had, right, was feeding these 350 people for 14 years and they ran out. That's why they moved from uh, Pakistan to India, because they ran out of money. And so that was the seed money that got started. And all centers, all centers everywhere are um, locally funded. We don't get uh, we don't get funds from somewhere else. You, you rerun a center and you yeah. somehow it all works. It all works. I know, right? It all works. It's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I don't ever think about it because I know it is a higher power. It's a higher cause. It's God's task and it'll get done. I never worry about it. That's a fascinating lesson right there. 14 years, 300 people. Most That's a lot of um, wealth, actually. Most people couldn't live more than about two months <clears throat> without working at the most. You know, it's hand to mouth. But so anyway... The, so money aside, that obviously this whole thing is not about money. It's about spiritual awakening. But it goes to show that when someone is coming from a higher place, somehow these things figure themselves out in a practical way. So it's worth tuning into these things that when we go into a spiritual path, the more we fully align with it, then a lot of other good things come our way as a side effect so right, that's number one, right. practicing, practicing, practicing. And instead of just knowing about things intellectually to actually put them into practice, see what happens. So what's the second thing that we can learn? I would say the second thing that Brahma Baba taught us, like just seeing his life, right? He was a trustee that everything belonged to God. 
he never felt anything belonged to him, nothing. And so after he created this trust and gave these eight women, right? These eight women he made trustees and they were the administrators of the trust. Even if he wanted a shirt, there was a system set up for how he could get a shirt. He couldn't just go take his money and go buy a shirt. So um, that's how surrendered he was, that everything belongs to God. Like he didn't think, oh, okay, I gave this trust, but then this this is belongs to me. And not just the money, right? Let's Let's leave the money aside. Let's leave shirts aside. Let's leave all of that aside. But even his mind and even his body, he really felt that it belongs to God, that there was no feeling of I or mine that he did something or something belongs to him, even his body. And we have a lot of his uh, share, you know, a lot of his churnings, a lot of his reflections. We have it written uh, in the more late comes and also, you know, in uh, some of the other things. And um, he, he shares, right? Even when he's feeding the body, even when he is eating, he says, God is feeding the body. It's God's body. God is, you know, it's ev everything belonged to God. Like there was no thought of anything belonging to me. I think that's a very deep secret because you can have so many negative thoughts when you take ownership of things. It's a very deep thing too, because there's, when we think something belongs to us, then we can get attached and we get stressed. And we, you know, so one of the teachings that we learn is surrender your burdens to God, give all the responsibilities up to the one, and then you receive it back as a trustee. And it's a different feeling to have to be a trustee of everything that we have. And in a, in a practical sense, we actually don't really own anything. Because even if let's say, for example, I own this house, and I own this camera, and I own all this stuff, realistically i could die today and what happens to all of it do i own it once as soon as i die what happens does it belong to me no it doesn't it doesn't belong to me because it never belonged to me because i'm just borrowing everything for a short amount of time so in a real sense spiritually practically none of us ever own anything except we kind of seem we pretend we own it it might be on a piece of paper like it might be like according to this piece of paper i own this house or according to this piece of paper i own whatever it is but the fact that we can die at any moment potentially and immediately lose everything we have goes to show that we actually don't really own any of it at any time it's a, an illusion that we're holding so brahma baba was very aware of this and he realized that ultimately everything belongs to god and he really is a trustee and that just liberated him from feeling stressed out, worried, because a lot of negative and challenging situations came to him from different people, from um, the environment, from there's loads of challenges that come up in anything. When anyone's trying to do some great work, there's going to be obstacles along the way. But he constantly let it go, let it go, let it go and realize that he's safe, he's secure, he's he's held. And everything worked out. And, he, and people who knew him practically said that there was never any lines of concern on his forehead under any of these extreme situations. Do you want to share any stories about this, these various unexpected challenges? You know, like you were talking about assassination attempts, right? Mm -hmm. There was this one assassination attempt, several assassination attempts on him but there was this one assassination attempt that i always remember always remember someone hired an assassin uh, to come and assassinate baba and um and there was a courtyard and baba was in the courtyard and this person uh, came to the gate gate of the courtyard and um, baba saw him and as soon as Baba, Brahma Baba saw him, he just went into deep meditation. So few of the, so there were 350 pe people, right? In seclusion with him. 
So all a few of these people, whatever they were doing, right? Some were, you know, doing something with the grain. Someone was sweeping the floor. Someone was doing something else. Um, someone was on the roof, you know, doing something. They all came, a few, about six or seven of them instantly came to Baba. They didn't know why. They just were called to come to Baba and they came near Baba and they surrounded Baba. So this assassin came and he saw all these people surrounding Baba and then not only that, he just saw light and then he went away. And so Baba, um, he, you know, what we call Toli, the Prasad, the, the, the sacred uh, suite, he, he asked for Toli and he gave this sacred suite to everyone and they all dispersed. So later that day, this assassin came back and asked for forgiveness from Baba. Oh, one of the things he said was when he was giving out Toli to all these sisters, he said, virtue is your only protection. And um, later the sister was asking what happened. So this assassin came, asked for forgiveness. Baba, of course, forgave him. Everything was fine. It all went on. And later one of the sisters was asking him, and so Baba said, when I remembered the Supreme Soul, everyone who was in remembrance of the Supreme Soul with beautiful, these virtues that each one had, they came and surrounded Baba and those virtues protected Baba. It was not even the people, the virtues protected Baba. And so I always think about that. Virtue is your only protection. That's very deep. And what happened to this guy? He came and asked for forgiveness. He came back. Baba forgave him. Yeah, yeah. He came back and he came back and um, we used to come regularly to meet Baba and stuff. <laughs> That's a bit of a turnaround, isn't it? <laughs> And, oh, um, and, you know, Baba was really forgiving, right? He was a very benefic bestower, very, very much so. Unconditional love. He never saw, uh, you know, these were this kind, that kind, this gender, that race, never, ever, totally soul conscious mm -hmm. love for everyone. And the third thing we can learn from him is about his minimalism, his understanding about not using facilities as um, in, instead of his spiritual practice. There's two words in, in Hindi, sadhana and sadhan, right? Sadhans. Sadhana means spiritual practice, higher consciousness, meditation, and sadhan is all the facilities like this camera and equipment and internet and you know, cars and buses and buildings and clothes and whatever else, right? And nowadays, it's quite possible for us to get caught up in our sada, in the equipment. In all, I mean, like even doing this podcast, quite frankly, like it's, we've got all these cameras and all this stuff and it, and it's complicated, right? And you can spend like an hour trying to say And I was teasing my call brothers make you wait all the time. That's right. That's right. It's like, there's always something, there's always something to get your hair just right, you know? And, and so, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that it can easily, as time goes on, you get more and more stuff that you think, oh, I can't do this service because I haven't got this special thing that I need and I need this thing. But Brahma Baba and the, the original souls who are there doing service, they didn't have anything, right? They were very, very, very simple. And yet they did such profound and powerful service. Do you want to share a little bit more about that? You know, after they moved to India, right? Um, they were they moved to India on the invitation of one person. That because India and Pakistan separated, and it was a lot of it was a very hard time for everyone in that subcontinent at that time, right? The British left, and so um, they moved to India in, in the invitation of one person, and then this person said, "Nope, sorry." And I can't help you. And so um, what happened was um, they he had 300 people with him. He had to he had 300 mouths to feed and no money. And Dadi Janki actually shares a lot of this, a lot of these stories at that time. But what happened was he, they all went out on service. All of these people went out on service. And he always used to keep the, the children, he used to say children, the children ahead of him, right? They, there was this one time they didn't have any money 
and there was just very liquid, watery dal and very dry chapati. And um, then he realized that the, some of the mothers were hungry. They didn't have any. So he divided his dal amongst every, uh, you know, these couple of mothers who needed it more. So he was very much a renunciate. And all of them, they were very uh, simple, but they were so powerful. Like, they, you know, they had such power in them, right? It was not, it, the power was not based on any kind of technology, any kind of facility. Um, and so um, that, that was very interesting. And also, right, Baba used to, um, he had a small room and he had a cot. Like it was one of those old fashioned cots. That's what he used to sleep on. And he used to have a really a hut, really a hut outside, a small hut. So he used to go between his little room and his little hut. And um, his bathroom was outside. And it was just a little makeshift little thing. It used to be outside and Mount Abu can be, get very cold in the winter. And that's what he used to do every day. Even in winter, whatever was outside the bathroom. And later on, they got this, you know, they got money. They had more, um, you know, buildings and stuff. But Baba refused to move from where he was. That was enough for him. He always stayed in those two places. However big the building was, right? Big buildings, whatever was going on, he never moved from his, his humble uh, place. So he had a little hut, a little bed, and a little, little room. And he had the bathroom outside in the cold. I mean, I've been in Mount Abu in the winter. It's really cold. It's, it's like being up it's here in, in Arizona cold, in like. winter. You know, it's like properly cold in the mountains, you know, freezing. Yeah, it's And there's it's no electricity. Colder, right? There's no, there was no like heating. Or Central anything. heat. No, and it's too hot in the summer as well. So it's too hot, too cold pretty much all the time. <laughs> and he didn't have anything at all. He just did his his practices he got up at two o'clock in the morning for his meditation i mean this is and he could have had whatever he wanted i mean if you think about some of these modern day gurus right there's a contrast right so I he know, had the right? potential to have all whatever he wanted because there was a lot of money came in and he had a lot of money to start with right so but some of these modern day gurus with their hundreds of rolls royces and and Porsches and whatever else right and various mansions and enormous um, places but the sign of true spirituality is to to focus on the thing that matters most and not all of the other stuff that doesn't matter. And we have to think about this. Are we caught up in our facilities? And he's he says, don't, don't, there's nothing wrong with the facilities. It's just I know we have to be moderate in a worthwhile way. We, he's not asking, you know, to just live in a hut. The, the method is not too simple and not too extravagant. So we, we don't want to be living in massive palaces with like gold plated everything and special fence. <laughs> That's going too far. But we also don't want to be living in absolute like little shack made out of wood you know, um, because that's going too far the other way. So somewhere in the middle, even though he was a bit more on the minimal side, he recommends that most people stay right in the middle somewhere between these two extremes. So this is a very deep thing. What's the what's the fourth secret? I think his absolute faith and intoxication, his mm -hmm. nischay. You know, nischay, his conviction. His conviction in the knowledge that was the supreme soul was giving to him. That, you know, we are souls, the supreme soul, the time period we are living in, what's happening. He had absolute conviction. And because of that conviction, he was so intoxicated, so intoxicated. Dadi Janki one time was sharing that um, she was doing something in the courtyard and she went and saw Baba in her, his room and Baba was dancing. And he was so intoxicated and dancing. Mm. And, you know, and that was Baba's personality, right? It was very rich. You couldn't say he was only this or he was only this. Like he had a balance of everything. So he was dancing. So he had such 
amazing intoxication about what was happening and the beauty of what was happening to him, the beauty of the spiritual world, the beauty of what the world that was going to come. And so that faith and intoxication, I think that was really, I think that is the fourth secret for us to have mm. absolute faith. You know, we have a saying that faith leads to victory, that we should never doubt. We should never doubt ourselves. We should never doubt the cosmic play. We should never doubt anyone else. You know, ultimately, everything is for our benefit. That's very deep. Yeah. So the faith, you know, the word is Nishje, isn't it? He had certainty, conviction, I mean, that all is good, that the things are happening and holding that future self very, very strongly, profoundly, so that there wasn't any sense of what's going to happen next and is it going to work and is this going to turn out the way I want it to. He was just in that experience that he'd already attained everything and to such an extent that he's dancing around and just in a state of ecstatic joy. I know, so right? Ecstatic bliss. <laughs> <laughs> I always think uh, physically if I met Baba, I would be in a state of ecstatic bliss too because <laughs> this right. must have been such a rich experience to be around him, right? Such right. an unusual soul, so selfless, so selfless. So we have a lot to learn. Just, just hearing about these things, like because in our life we need role models. We need people who actually have done these things because it makes it more when you can imagine this and you understand these things then you can think oh i could be more like that myself right because you see it and the world we live in today with tv and the internet and all this stuff it has a lot of bad role models people who are angry and nasty and doing all this shady stuff all the time so to have good role models is a quite a rare thing as someone who has complete conviction who's let go of everything and is in constant joy and happiness and bliss and freedom and doesn't get worried about anything. I mean, this is such a wonderful thing to even think about. So we're very blessed. What's the next secret? I think all relationships with the one, that he had all relationships with the Supreme. I think that would be a really big secret for enlightenment. You know, especially the three relationships of parent, teacher, and Sadhguru. That the supreme soul, when we say the supreme soul, right, for us, the supreme soul is beyond cycle of birth and death. So the supreme soul is always light. He's always, he's beyond ajanma. He's beyond the cycle of birth and death. He doesn't come into um, human body like we do and take birth and all of those things. And so to have that relationship with a spiritual being as your parent, with the spiritual being as your teacher, with your spiritual being as a Satguru. I feel that was Brahma Baba's secret, fifth secret for absolute enlightenment. Because he, uh, what I've heard from the Dadis is, uh, even from Moini Didi, what I've heard is the souls that were with him all the time is that he never thought of anyone else. His, all his relationships was with the Supreme. All his relationships were spiritual relationships. He had a lot of love for everyone. He kept in contact. He, he stayed up nights and gave sakash and gave power and all of that to souls, send good wishes for everyone. And he really was there for souls. But ultimately, his relationship was with the Supreme. He took all the, all the power from God. All the power from rather God, than, yes. Rather than needing anything from people. So then he could give to other people, other souls, because he didn't need anything. A absolute right. faith. The absolute faith that he had. The, uh, you know, the fidelity of the soul with the supreme soul, right? Like there's no one else coming in between you and the supreme soul. Hmm. That's amazing. So what do you think? Give, give us a secret, Michael. Well, another thing, he was absolutely stable on the rails of the drama. This is one of the method teachings that was revealed through him, is that this is a drama. This is a, a movie, a movie, that life is a big movie, 
predestined movie, right? So you can imagine this is a whole a movie, and we have a part in the movie, and we are both creating and witnessing the movie happening. And this is a fascinating thing to understand, but he had the complete conviction that it is a movie all the time. And he had total trust that whatever was happening in the movie of life was good. So even if he was, you know, about to be assassinated or, <laughs> um, you know, didn't have any money and had to feed all these people and all these various challenges that came up, he didn't lose his intoxication and his sense of freedom and joy because of that, because he knew that this is a benevolent movie of life that has secrets in it. And he didn't let himself get upset by the movie. And of course, this is quite an unusual thing because most people are constantly getting upset about pretty much everything. All the time. Oh, it shouldn't be like this, it shouldn't be like this. Why did it happen? What happened? So the, one of the things he taught and he practiced is instead of saying why, he said wa. Wa means wonderful. It's a Hindi word. Wonderful, wa. So he, instead of saying why, he said wa. <laughs> And this is a wonderful teaching for us to, instead of thinking, why did it happen? What happened? How did it happen? Why isn't it not happening? And he said, wow, <laughs> this is great. It's wonderful, right? And, and so that's how he maintained his intoxication of complete certainty that this is meant to happen the way it is. It happened like this before. It's supposed to happen like this. Everything is moving along exactly the way it's meant to. So for me, one of the one of the most inspiring things is the fact that he was constantly receiving from from God, from the one, and he had a state of complete freedom in life, Jivan Mukti. He was Jivan Mukt. It means he had liberation while he was alive because he didn't let himself get into these questions and worries and concerns and stress about all these different things. It's not that he didn't have challenges. In fact, he had a lot more challenges than nearly all of us have ever had. So he had far more difficulties, but it didn't let him, didn't make him upset. He had, he was stable in his stage of a detached observer of the movie, like he was watching a movie and didn't let himself lose his joy because of events occurring on the screen. This is a very, very deep thing. <laughs> it is an amazing thing. To even see that aspect of spiritual reality, right? That there is a play going on, that to understand that spiritual reality and to really stay stable in that spiritual reality is such an amazing feat. So this is something we can practice. All these things are things we can think, okay, how did he do it? How can I do this? At least try it out. These, these are things, just even one of these things, if you let, let yourself just go into that practice a little bit, then you can see for yourself what the effect of it actually is in your life. So what's our final secret? So of course, we could could add one more. <laughs> There's, what's the last one for, for now? Yes, um, the last one for now would be his uh, bestower. He was just a bestower, constantly, constantly, constantly bestowing. Uh, on so many levels, right? He used to bestow through his knowledge. Even when he was in the hospital, he would get up and share some knowledge. Um, and he was constantly bestowing through his thoughts that never, ever saw any defect in anyone, ever looked down on people, always giving that respect to everyone and always having good wishes, pure feelings and giving blessings to everyone, always. So he was constantly a bestower. And so that kind of unlimited service that Baba did, you know, so easy, right? Like you see his pictures, you know, doing things. Mm -hmm. He was a karma yogi, like he used to be performing karma, but still he was in deep yoga. And it was such a simple life, but such a profoundly great life. I mean, out like if you look at Baba's life, right, on the outside, it looks so simple. He looks so ordinary. 
with his white dhoti and white kurta so ordinary but he was he had such an extraordinary extraordinary internal life and he had such an extraordinary influence on so many people millions of people like my life you know my life really i have a life spiritual life is because of brahma baba and so um that kind of how he did it so easy everything was so easy there was no he was bestowing constantly bestowing constantly doing things but it was so easy and graceful natural ease and grace because he received so much power from the one from god that he had a lot to give so it just overflowed through his being and so that i mean all these things are connected aren't they that the more we trust and we receive and we connect and then we give and we we realize where that power comes from so these are fascinating things just to tune into what, what can you take in your life out of these just think of maybe one or two things that touched your heart and how and can you bring that into your being i feel the one thing that brahma baba left so many things for me but the one thing that brahma baba left for me is to dream big hmm. right dream a big dream for yourself don't get caught up in small little things you know don't have a small life when i say a small life a great life i don't mean to do great ex physical extraordinary things but just internally it has to be a expansive life for everyone mm -hmm. right in service of humanity service of everyone just your being should you know help people but also you have to have a big aim for yourself i don't mm -hmm. be satisfied with little little things have a big aim for yourself and so even if we aim right yes i am going to get enlightened like brahma baba even that little that's a big aim even that one aim if we have i want to become enlightened like brahma baba you will see how the supreme soul will give back in response to that aim and he he used to see the people in the west before anyone was in the west so these and things you're here that, because of his vision <laughs> i am as well yeah so like and so many other people right if it wasn't for that no no one would be here right so the, these he imagined all these things in his mind the whole world when there was really nothing much going on and he had this conviction that it is already done it is already done it is already done and wouldn't budge from that even though there was no evidence of it practically it came to pass down the road and even him seeing these nuclear bombs going off before there was a nuclear bomb um so that he saw all these things the change in the world the shifts in consciousness change in, in people so just for everyone listening just think what is one or two things you can take from from these things we've shared and we also have the ancient spiritual secrets course which you're welcome to do which is based on the knowledge that he revealed and you will learn a lot of fascinating things in that course and in the deeper teachings that you can get as well should we do a blessing yes we always do a blessing okay do this blessing is for everyone's enlightenment and especially right. yours and mine total enlightenment total karmatith royalty you've achieved a profound inner state of dignity your noble nature is an ever present crown atop your head no challenge can break its brilliance through immense courage you've masterfully guided your own heart and mind ah so just breathe it all in giving thanks let's just take a moment to feel that it is done that everyone all of us whether whether we like it or not actually but we might as well do this on our own we're going to reach that karma tea, that enlightened state at some point and we might as well embrace that and do what we need to do to re-experience that higher state of consciousness so let's just take one minute now or 30 seconds just to hold the vision of yourself as an enlightened being full of happiness and lightness and peace and freedom 
and how would it feel when you are enlightened? Stay with that feeling and talk to you soon. Watch out, Dave.